Hi, this is from Ideology to Unity. So I've been wondering about what kind of non dualistic response I could make, what kind of new age response I have to radical feminism or feminism. And and the fact that there are people in the New Age community who believe in it, or at least hold aspects of it in their belief system. So, to put it really simply, my response is that the cause of oppressive and restrictive gender roles which are an ident which are identities and the cause of this is ego so that's the simple answer but what i'm going to do is i'm going to backtrack take a broader perspective and build up to why that's my position so let's rewind to the fall of Atlantis. Now, there's obviously a lot of specific information that I don't really recall right now or have available right now. Unless I want to access the Akashic Records, but I'm not really adept at that yet. Or am I? I don't know. <laughs> so, um, there was something that you could call a, a fall from grace that humanity went through. It was, and it's described actually in the Emerald Tablets of Thoth, among other sources, and people have had a reincarnation, not, well, memories of past lives about, about the fall of Atlantis as well. So there have been there has been information from a variety of sources, some of it channeled, you know, about what happened there. But to cut it short, basically there were some dark rituals around the time of where they could have ascended, perhaps, around an astrological point similar to where we're at now. And what happened was that there were a lot of dark rituals and that serves the self souls or those that have chosen that path, we're doing a lot of rituals to interfere with the ascension process. And they succeeded. They did a lot of dark rituals that effectively what it did is the energy grid, Gaia's energy grid on Earth, it basically, they corrupted it. There were these port energetic portals. And they, I think naturally, they were a way that people could heal. Um, but, and there was a lot of loving, unconditional love coming through from these portals. But what they did is they reversed the polarity of these portals and made them negative portals. And what this fundamental negatively orientated portals I suppose you could say a fear of guilt of negative dense emotions of neg you know negatively oriented portals and what this did is and how this affected the grid is that basically it corrupted the grid um and since then well the Atlanteans fell humanity fell into a state of into ego essentially and since last 12,000 years uh, humanity has been very much in ego and I don't know the details as to how this wounded the masculine but I know or exactly what that means and entails but I know that the masculine got wounded and I suspect it was around then that's what resonates with me anyway the idea that it was then when the masculine got um, wounded it might have something to do with the dark rituals themselves um, I have a sense that 
if sexual energy is something that's used for healing, it's also used for negative rituals as well. For the opposite of healing. Uh, let's, not, let's not get into that right now. Um, but essentially, there's a, a ego is there's been a lot more ego and a lot of more dense frequencies since then um and what the ego does is it seeks control and it seeks um and it's it's afraid it seeks ways of dealing with its fear and trauma and this often involves negative self-beliefs and so forth but what it can involve is, well, there's something called the drama triangle, which is basically there's the victim, perpetrator, and the rescuer. And abuse and negative dynamics and drama generally often plays into these roles where people switch around from time to time, but they will take one role or the other. Um, but often it has been that uh, the what well, the created is often a situation where men took a or at least in, in, with regard to the rea- in the relations between men and women uh, often men took a perpetrator position which is fundamentally where the ego seeks to cope with spheres and to identificate and, and to reinforce itself through identification with being the perpetrator. And what the perpetrator does is they're afraid of what happens if they don't have control. They're afraid of getting hurt and going back to when they were hurt. So they maintain control in order to feel safe. The perpetrator feels safe by taking a... No, not the perpetrator. So the victim take feels safe by taking a subordinate position so that they won't be hurt by the perpetrator. They, and they might even feel comforted by the idea of yeah, taking a subordinate position and not taking on the initiative of personal responsibility and so forth because that might involve getting hurt or what they're afraid of. They're afraid of that anyway. And then there's the rescuer who seeks to save, who reinforces their ego by the idea of they, their ego reinforces itself by they save a victim, a victim from an oppressor and or a, a perpetrator. And basically it's like it's like a crusade sort of mentality, it's like where they project their their negativity onto others. And they're like, those guys are perpetrators and I'm going to save the victims from them and I'll be a noble, righteous person by doing so. That's the um, rescuer. And as you can see, there's a lot of toxic human dynamics in society that have gone on for thousands of years that have played along these sort of terms. But often with men and women, the men took the perpetrator position and the wounded masculine especially took the perpetrator position. And so a key point here is that identity is egoic. In fact, what the ego does is adopt as many identities as it can to reinforce its sense of security. Because in a society where there's social hierarchy and social status um the more identities and the strong and the more identities are how the ego reinforces its own self its existence and its sense of safety because if you're if you go back to the fundamentally uh, a tribe in a primeval tribe you know if your identity as let's say a hunter right if that's compromised if you fail if you do not meet 
what a, the identity of a hunter is understood to be, as in you, you do not successfully bring back the deer on a regular basis, let's say, then that could have huge and huge impact on your safety and your well-being because the tribe might like turn on you or something. They might uh or they might exile you or what have you. There, there might be drastic consequences for you. And so back then the ego played a key role. Right. But if you're going back to like uh when we lived in caves and stuff, right? But now we've got to a point where we no longer really need it. But what happens is the ego gets as many ego identities as possible because an identity is a... You can have a sense of control based around identity and it's, it's, how, it's how the ego reinforces itself and builds safe anyway. And if it's a, a more prestigious uh, identity, especially like... I mean, being smart or strong, these are prestigious, but particularly like high social status, being a king or uh, being rich or a successful scientist or businessman, these, the more high flying it is, the more successful it is. But the ego will, will, it will even take a very weak, it will take the idea of being a victim or being, um, it will take any identity, even if it's, the idea of someone who hurts the weak, you know, a serial killer, even, you know, it doesn't matter. Any identity, no matter how positive, negative, whatever that means, you know, it will adopt what it can to maintain itself. That's the point. Okay. But, but it will try to rise in social status and maintain its social status and maintain its identities as much as it can. That's why it feels threatened when, that's what people feel egos feel threatened when criticized and or humiliated or embarrassed and that's where when people feel that way they might fight for it or they might feel sad or they might freeze up and get scared or what have you and get anxious and stuff so i'm not going to go into detail about that because that's not really the point but the point is that basically So identity is an ego, right? And is egoic. And the identity of an oppressed woman, oppressed by patriarchy and the gender roles is an identity. I mean, it's outright identity politics, but it's an identity. And also the identity of an oppressive man who exploits women and oppresses women in a patriarchy is also a, it's an identity. And I will add also that someone who opposes feminism is also an identity. A men's rights activist is an identity. Um, for example, as well. So, or an anti feminist is an identity. There's, there's also identities. And all of these things are ego. They are. They, they, there's something that, that they feel threatened by, and there's something that they oppose, and there's something that they get a sense of, a full sense of self from opposing. And, and, um, A sense of control from believing in being what they are. That there's a label, that's what they are. They feel that they feel safer identifying with that, even though it causes them to actually feel unsafe when it's threatened, which inevitably it is. So the issue is that ego is the cause of ego in the wound masculine and the energy group being corrupted. That's the cause of all this of the gender roles. And the, the idea of these strict gender roles that are restrictive and also rigid and 
these are these gender roles, even Eckhart Tolle points out, but these gender roles are themselves they're restrictive because they're ego identities, right? And because without having that clear cut dualistic identity structure, you the ego doesn't have the ego needs there to be men and women in a diametrically opposed sense with these equalities men have, these equalities women have, and they're different and they're separate. And that idea is fundamentally linked to identity. People fundamentally, the ego's identity is fundamentally like there's a fundamentally rooted sense of self in what your identity is. There's a whole bunch of other things, but this is a very fun foundational thing is, okay, you're a man or you're a woman. Often their identities are built on that basis as well. So, so, These, now, so, but this is something that, so feminists, I won't say so much the first wave, but second and third wave feminists noticed that they noticed that the gender roles themselves are restricted. They, they noticed that they actually, that women and even men um, feel this compelled to live up to these strict patriarchal gender roles and all the associations built into those roles. And that when women can't live up to that, they might get shamed. If men can't live up to it, they might get shamed for not being macho or whatever, right? And that, or they might feel shamed at themselves for not living up to it. They might feel like they've got lower self-worth. And they were right in recognizing that it is very restrictive. And, and that it does, the oppression of women did involve that. But what they miss because the, if they were if they knew if they were understand of if they understood the role of ego the way Buddhists understand it and New Age or New Thought mysticism if they had those insights about ego and how ego identity is ego and how identities. Are restrictive and how gender roles are identities and restrict people on that basis and are basically so gender the gender roles are fundamentally egoic and fundamentally restrictive in that sense and a lot of suffering comes from identifying with being a man or a woman right and everything and all the associations that come with those identities right um but they didn't have that understanding. And it's not to blame them. I mean, a lot of people don't grow up with access to Buddhist teachings or what have you, right? So you can't really put it, blame them for it. It's just how it turned out, right? But they didn't have that non-dualistic, non-egoic mindset. And honestly, most people have been an ego, especially, I mean, it's the people coming out of ego is accelerating, but and in any case, at the time of second, third wave feminism, even now, there's a lot of people who they, they, they are aware of the oppression that has happened towards women and also men and how the gender roles are restricted. They don't have a holistic spiritual perspective on this, at least not yet. And they may be dwelling in ego a lot. They may, if they haven't awakened, they're probably 
and haven't gone to a dark night of the soul and the whole process of inner work and stuff, they've probably got um, a lot of ego involved in how they, in their cognition, essentially. So inevitably, they see it in terms of a victim mentality that they are have been vic- they are a victim of oppression that is not just that is systematic and they see social conditioning in society where people are conditioned to fit into roles growing up because people who believe in gender roles will they will teach their children about gender roles and naturally people condition each other and socially and socially condition each other in society and or at least egos do that and so they see they're not aware of that but what they do see is there is social conditioning to fit people into gender roles they see restriction and they by these gender roles they see suffering by people not fitting into that being shamed for not being you know or not feeling worthy but not fitting into that and so forth and they're like okay so there's a patriarchy as a this patriot these patriarchal norms fit into an overarching system and this oppresses women perhaps even men and restricts them to and restricts them right they saw that and they're just like well we need as many people to understand that there's an oppressive system as possible right and that they even see that certain men might get benefits in certain respect from from this even though men might be disadvantaged they in certain ways by having to live up to these roles there might be certain ways in which if society subordinates women in certain regards or if all women often take a are victimized in some sort of sense or taken in theory less empowered position that this would um that men, by comparison, might benefit in certain ways. Okay, perhaps. So, it, it, essentially, they developed a, a whole belief system based around their understanding of women being oppressed. And there were certainly things that they noticed that were valid. You know, they they did notice that a lot of these things, which. There is definitely social condition going on. There is definitely gender roles being restrictive and detrimental and so forth. Um, there might even be certain ways in which men benefit and women are harmed by those gender roles and the conditioning. Okay, yeah, absolutely. The thing is, though, that they don't see the ego as the cause of all this. They have no understanding of the fall of Atlantis, which honestly is, you, we could understand it just understanding that e- identity is ego and the, ident- and the gender roles and patriarchal norms are identity and ego. The, the origin of this, of the return of the fall of Atlantis, is not actually essential to understand. That we could, I could have not mentioned that, and honestly, my argument would still, would still still hold up, right? So, it, just, it might help to understand the origin of it. Anyway. So they don't understand, they don't understand all of any of that. And that's not their fault. That's not something to blame them for, obviously. It just is how it is. That's how things played out. <sighs> what then? So what we get is so naturally they try to sway people to understand that but when you're attached to the idea of someone believing what you believe as this is what happens with ideology generally when you're attached to changing people's mind attached to the outcome of changing someone's mind um you're trying to basically exert some degree of control over their beliefs and their mind, whether you realize it or not. And if you feel aggrieved or resentment and anger and fear associated with towards men or about patriarchy, if you feel 
if someone feels resentment about their, their ideology in general, what will happen is, what will happen is that they will be kind of verbally aggressive, essentially, in how they communicate that. And essentially, the person receiving it, either they'll be receptive to it and they will adopt that kind of ideology anyway because they might want to, if it's a man, they might be receptive to the idea of believing that they're oppressive in certain ways, especially if they're... There's various reasons why someone might be predisposed to agree with it, but pardon me. But suppose someone isn't and a man, it's likely that someone might feel threatened by it and be like, no, 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 I, I'm not. I, I, they might not want the, I like the idea of, of the idea of accepting the idea of that they've got loads of privilege and that they, they might feel threatened. They might feel, well, people like, they might, they might feel, I mean, especially if they're in ego, which most people are, to be honest, like their egos will feel threatened by all this and they will feel attacked and they will feel psychological suffering that will be obviously suffering actually comes from within and it's triggered by external things that are projected as the cause but ultimately it's internal causes for suffering but they won't know that and they will identify feminism as the cause of their suffering and they might see people they they might see other people um and identify those people as being as suffering due to feminism as being they might see people being berated and being shamed socially and they might be like they might be like no i, I don't like this and in fact i'm going to oppose this threat right they might see it that way um because if someone's got an identity that is fundamentally threatened, if someone's got an egoic identity that's, that is, if an, if an egoic identity is threatened, there'll be a natural inclination to fight to defend it. And that's where anger gets involved. And so naturally, either they'll just give up their identity because they're more scared of, because if you fight it, you might potentially lose it at, and the identity of being someone who's because if socially acceptable norms change then someone might need to adjust their identities in order to be in order to maintain their social status and their other identities and they might be need to sacrifice them some of them and that might be why some people some men voluntarily go along with feminism because uh, they, they might be more scared of not going on with it. Um, or they might just believe in it. You know, there might just not be an ideology that makes sense to them on some level. Um, but yeah, the, the, the ego will be threatened and they will, they will fight it and they will view it as a threat to their safety and their well-being. And in fact, it may well be, from an egoic perspective, you know, their ego will their social status will be threatened, right? And subconsciously, your position in the tribe and your safety will be threatened. Or at least from, in terms of how the ego is fundamentally conditioned and the way it functions, it will identify on a subconscious basis, a threat to safety and existence by its identity being threatened. And so yeah, it will feel that people will react like they're being attacked by a lion. When, so someone who doesn't agree with feminism feels threatened by it, well, they'll, they'll feel like, this, like they're being attacked, literally, right? By, like there's actually someone attacking them physically. That's how it will feel for them. And they'll get in the fight or flight mentality. And when you get, you know, and then they'll fight back in terms of that's how they'll see it um, and start criticizing feminism or, or what have you. And what you get is the, the feminists themselves will, if they weren't originally um, in fight or flight, 
which to be fair, if they were berating people in the first place, they were in fight. Uh, it fight or flight, you know. But then, then there'll be this back and forth of ideological struggle, which is all ego, one, one set of egoic identities fighting other egoic identities, and a whole load of suffering involved. And it's divisive, fundamentally divisive. And there's not healing involved in that dynamic. And fundamentally, also, we've got to consider that feminism actually rests on the assumption of, it rests on the identities of man and woman, right? Now, traditional gender roles and patriarchal norms, what they do is they, they associate and label the women and man and woman in a whole bunch of traditional ways, right? But what feminism does, it says, or especially radical feminism, right? These are just labels anyway, but it associates a whole load of toxic things on to masculine. It says, okay, it identifies the, the wounded masculine as toxic, not inherently, but that as it is, but it's manifesting in a toxic way or it's become toxic, right? And that's what they mean when they talk about toxic masculinity. They are actually pointing to something actually real and it's the wounded masculine. That's what they're pointing to, but they, they're seeing it from only one point of view, only one perspective. So not a holistic perspective, but they are seeing it. They are seeing it. And they, they'll put things onto women, and including a sense of being victims. And they'll see a patriarchal oppression as a grand overarching narrative. And egos love tragic stories, right? They love a story, and the ego loves a story that where they're the victim. And so that's, and stories tend to be woven to reinforce their egoic identities. And so, yeah, just as there's a story of a traditionalist story that's fundamentally linked to the traditional gender roles, the, it creates, the, what you get is the, the, these new gender roles. And these new gender roles are feminist gender roles. And it's the, the feminist role of the oppressor, the oppressive man, and the victimized woman, essentially. But they're reinforcing the very gender identities, the very gender roles that they identify as the problem by opposing, by, yeah, they're reinforcing it by analyzing male female dynamics on the basis of those identities, right? And so essentially they're bringing about the opposite of what they want, of their, what their ideology is supposed to bring about, which is the liberation of women from oppression by, and women be more safe. They're, they're bringing the opposite of that by they're reinforcing gender identities and gender roles and creating a, an oppositional dualistic dynamic between feminists and anti-feminists or feminists and anyone who isn't a feminist. And a duality, it doesn't understand the whole, when you're in duality, you don't understand the whole picture. You understand one side of it, the other side understands the other side of it, and they're fighting. But the overall holistic perspective isn't understood. And unconditional love is non-dualistic. Right? Love is non-dualistic. What we call, associate with love in a romantic sense that is not unconditional, that's not really love in the true sense. There might be aspects of love to it, but it's very much conditional. And so it's this idea of you can be loved and respected, but only if you agree with our ideology. And just that people disagreeing over which ideology is the one which you, you deserve to be treated with dignity for believing. <laughs> so it's like, it's a, it's a really toxic dynamic that, is being, that happens with ideology generally. 
and it's like and it's not just feminism it's, it's all ideologies right including men going their own way so to speak you know or men's men's rights activists they've got this idea they've got the same sort of dynamic but they've got men being a victim right and if you look at Mukhtar, they see it in terms of women being the oppressor, which is just like, it's the, it's the exact same thing, but with the role swapped around. In fact, they've got a whole set of egoic stories about how men have been treated badly throughout history, by how to fight wars and how women do manipulation and blah, 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 blah. So <clears throat> this is a context in which the solution, in my opinion, is that what we need to do is recognize first that all identity is egoic, that ego and that, yeah, as a, ego is the core, ego is the cause of identity and ident an egoic identity is what Fem feminism involves egoic identity and thus we need to let go of egoic identity all identities actually and it also means that the gender roles we need to let go of the gender roles or at least let go of attachment to gender it doesn't mean oh gender abandoning gender altogether it's not real well we can but it's kind of like it's more like we need to let go of attachment to it so if someone can play into the divine masculine or play into divine feminine right but the attachment to that, the egoic attachment to who you, a full sense of identity based around being man or based around being a woman and associations with being a man or a woman. Like feminists actually write that that is actually unhelpful and detrimental. So what we need to do is let go of what does not, not or no longer serves. And that involves ego, that involves all identity, and that involves any and involves letting go of ideology, ideology and any egoic identities involved in ideology. And that requires letting go of the idea of being oppressed, of women being oppressed by a patriarchy. That doesn't mean you don't recognize that patriarchal norms are uh, detrimental. Now, obviously, a patriarchal and patriarchy aren't actually the same thing. Patriarchal is just a type of identity or a type of gender role right it's just that that are framed in the terms of um that women have subordinate roles and men have um more dominant roles right maybe i'm not defining it properly but essentially that's it anyway um whereas patriarchy is this grand overarching system of uh socially conditioned oppression and that you need to believe that you're subconsciously a bigot and if you don't you're subconsciously a bigot so the only way to not be a subconscious bigot is to think that you're a subconscious bigot it's kind of contradictory but in any case um that's my answer anyway to the issue I, maybe i'll get to sum it up by my initial very brief summary. Maybe the whole rest of it is unnecessary, but I, I felt like expressing this. Jeez, I wonder how long I actually took. I don't know, but hopefully that helps um, in some way. That's not to say now. I, I want to clarify here that I'm not taking an oppositional stance to feminism. Um. That that would not be helpful. It this isn't like say, ha, got you. This is why you're, you're debunked. This is a, uh, uh, what was it? You, you, you get these things online, don't you? you these feminist fail videos or something. Like it's just like, it's just kind of this dualistic opposition or where there's one identity, there's one ideology and another, and you could one to win and silence the other in order to feel safe. It's fundamentally egoic, right? This isn't what it's about. This is, and in fact, anti-feminists are just as blinded as feminists. Although that's itself is kind of 
bit that way it's not a helpful way to put it is it basically yeah um we need to let go of egoic identities of all kinds and it's understandable that people have before they get into new age spirituality or spirituality or whatever however you call it people have their egoic biases and their identities and their ideologies and that's understandable in a world with so much ego it's absolutely understandable and it takes a while to let go of all this. It doesn't happen immediately, or it could in some cases, but it doesn't happen immediately. It, it, there's a process. And so this is something well, it's not, we, it's important not to judge when it, when it comes to this. So um, yeah, uh, hopefully you found this helpful and um, have a good day and bye for now.